Healthy eating, regular exercise, and positive thinking are keys to a better life, right? Well, wrong, according to this next guest. Joining us now for why he thinks wellness has instead become a destructive ideology. In Stockholm, Sweden, via Skype, there's Carl Sederstrom, professor of organization studies at Stockholm's business school at Stockholm University and the co-author of The Wellness Syndrome. Carl, it's nice to have you on the line from across the Atlantic Ocean. Can we just start by having you define for us what you think the word wellness means? All right, so um, wellness here, and especially when we think about wellness as an ideology, it is um, trying to reach uh, some kind of illusory state of perfect well-being. So it's not just health in the ordinary sense in terms of trying to live a healthy, nice, good life. It's more about trying to achieve some sense of illusory uh, uh, well-being. Wellness as such is kind of a, a, a self-help uh, construct which isn't meant to, 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 be, to be attained because then the whole wellness industry, the whole self-help industry would collapse, right? Well, let's, let's follow up with this. You call it a syndrome. Now, wh where I come from, a syndrome sounds a bit like a disease. Is that what you mean to say? Well, we are thinking about it in two uh, ways. One is in a more individual way where syndrome would refer to a set of symptoms. So the symptoms we are thinking about here would be the sense of guilt that you derive from never attaining that goal and also a sense of anxiety that you're always expected to make the best out of the situation you're in, which honestly isn't always that easy. So that's a syndrome on the more individual level. But then we also think about syndrome here as a political or an ideological, ideological level, which means that if you want to understand health, you know, look at uh, you know, uh, economy, look at, you know, political questions, look at class. I mean, that is where you find whether someone is healthy or not. And what the wellness syndrome does on a political level is, uh, you know, essentially individualizing what is a political or a social problem. So that is what we mean by the syndrome, both something which act, which plays itself out on an individual level and something which plays itself out on a social and political level. But who do you think is out there arguing that this is all about morality? Well, I think that's very clear that you can see um, that you can see that uh, uh, well, if, if you look at people who are smoking cigarettes or people who are unhealthy, very often those people are being referred to as people who are lazy, people who are weak willed, people who haven't uh, sort of done enough to show that they are good citizens. Just to take one example from the UK, David Cameron, not too long time ago, suggested that people who are uh, obese should um, perhaps lose their uh, benefit if they didn't start working out going to uh, to the gym. So I mean, maybe he's not saying that uh, fat people, obese people are worse than uh, people who are skinny or, or who are fit, but still they are being, if you like, demonized, they are being punished. I mean, again, you can look at popular culture where uh, overweight people are routinely uh, portrayed as, you know, ba bad people. So, but again, you know, the, the, the morality issue here isn't entirely new. I mean, this is something which we've had a long time in the Scandinavian countries. I mean, National Socialism in Germany is, a, is, is an interesting case in terms of seeing uh, smokers and uh, unhealthy people as morally very bad people. The big difference now is that uh, when you are expected to be uh, healthy, who do you owe this obligation to? I mean, uh, usually, if you go back um, to Scandinavian countries, for example, in the 1930s, 1940s, there was a very strong idea of public health. There was a very strong idea that you had a duty to be healthy with regard to the state. But now, this duty seems to be much more sort of ambiguous to who, to who do we owe this responsibility. It seems to be a strong, uh, a strong command, a strong duty that we have, but still very ambiguous for us to, to ask who, who, who we owe this responsibility to. Just to follow up on that, I've got a quote from your book I want to read, and then I'll come back with a question. You say, eating has become a paranoid activity, which is not just intended to bring momentary pleasures through taste. It puts your identity to the test. To eat correctly is an achievement which demonstrates your superior life skills. Now, we are, of course, living in an age where everybody's busy, it's easy to run out of food, and therefore even easier to go out and buy something cheap and quick that may be unhealthy, but at least fills you up. So is it a bit of an achievement uh, to be aware of what you put in your body, and isn't that a good thing? 
Well, I think that's a great thing. But if you look at the people who are already eating quite well, those would generally be people who are already quite well off, people from the middle class, upper middle class, those uh, who are living in neighborhoods where you have supermarkets selling these sorts of health food, living in neighborhoods where you have yoga studios to attend, uh, living in neighborhoods where you have all of these things readily available. And then if you think that this is something which will make you into a better human being, then essentially what you say is that if you're born into a particular class and you are a better human being, because meanwhile you have people living in uh, areas where you don't have the same availability of organic kale smoothies and uh, whatever other kind of health food that is now available. And does that mean that these people are in any way sort of uh, worse than we are? Maybe, you know, in some ways, yes, it's an achievement if we can create a collective culture, I would say, where we enjoy food and we could eat healthy and nice food. You know, that's the kind of culture I would want to live in. But when we think about this as a kind of individual enterprise and when you pride yourself, you know, uh, think about you as a better human being on the basis of uh, having bought a new kind of healthy uh, food product, I think that is deeply problematic. Not that it's wrong with eating healthy, but it's wrong to think of that as something which would single you out as a better human being. Because, well, in the end of the day, we know who these people are who are buying this. It's people like myself who, who sit here who would live in a very uh, uh, nice neighborhood with all of these things around me. Uh, whereas those people who, who, who don't have this uh, around them will, will not consume this. And are they worse people for that? I don't think so. Hmm. Carl, one thing I've learned over the years is that there is a TED Talk for everything. So we're going to play a clip of a TED Talk now. This is Ty Lopez who does self-help programs and books, and he was speaking at an independent TEDx event. Here's a little clip, and then we'll come back and chat. Let's roll it, please, Sheldon. The average American buys 17 books a year, maybe reads one a month. You should read at least one book a week. Because remember, everybody wants the good life, but not everybody's willing to read to get it. You must read more. You think there's some truth in what he says there? <laughs> that we should read more. Reading self-help books, I would, I would strongly advise against, to, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I mean, uh, having actually read through quite a lot of these uh, uh, books when writing, when writing this book, I mean, if you just take and look at these advice, they are deeply problematic. I mean, there are some books which suggest that we should understand the, uh, the problem with the 1% versus the 99% in terms of positive thinking, that it is only 1% of the people who have cracked the code and understood properly how you should think positively. Reading a book like that, I think, is not just a waste of time. I think it's, 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 it could be damaging. Another, I think one of the worst self-help books I came across doing research for this book was one which was uh, talking about extreme resilience, that the best thing that you could develop as a human being is the ability to very quickly stand up as soon as you've been beaten down. And this person suggests that if you're a shop owner, and, it, it, and uh, the, the shop is being burned down, then maybe that would be the best opportunity for your life ever. And then this person goes on to say, try it. So no, <laughs> I think you know, reading self-help books, well, that may be one thing, but reading them and then trying to do what, what, what this book said, that could be extremely damaging. I mean, I've done you know, my share of reading. I mean, I've read more self-help books than I think uh, is healthy. I think they're all I've on the shelf behind you. For, uh, You've got an amazing library there. Yeah, um, well, I don't think, I mean, I think all of the self-help books I, I have actually uh, are thrown away afterwards, so hopefully <laughs> there aren't too many of them in the back. Uh, a much better book to read in that case would be someone like Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Smile or Die, hmm. which is a very nice account of the, what is very problematic with the positive thinking, which is essentially about uh, making people take responsibility for their own life. Well, well, very nice, but let's say you have a cancer. Does that mean that you should take responsibility for it? Does that mean that it was your own fault that you got cancer? I mean, some positive thinking uh, people would suggest that that is in fact the case. I mean, one of the most extreme examples, I won't even mention the name of, of, of this person, suggested that the people who died in the tsunami may have had themselves to uh, blame. I mean, she was pushed by a journalist to say, did these people actually will this accident onto themselves? And her response was, maybe not, but they were, quote, on the same frequency as the event. This is an example from, from Barbara Ehrenreich's book, which, hmm. is, which is very good. And that is deeply problematic. So I would say, yes, please do read a lot, but avoid the self-help literature if you can.
Well, I take your point, but having said that, I also, if I read it correctly in your book, noted that many companies nowadays are encouraging their employees to stay fit because they think that makes for better employees. There are cafeterias now with healthy foods. There are designated exercise breaks during company time. There are on-site gym facilities and so on. There are even some people who've got treadmills at their desks or bicycles at their desks. Uh, this is the way we're going, my friend, and I wonder whether you think the case that you're making is in some respects spitting into a very, very strong wind. Well, yes, I, I think unfortunately that might be the case. I mean, don't forget the spinning meeting. So, I mean, usually you would have meetings sitting down and then the next step is that you should go for a walking meeting because that would make you more creative. Now there is the spinning meeting. So you sit around on stationary bikes trying to come up with brilliant ideas. And you can see how the workplace is more and more sort of turning into something resembling a gym facility. And yes, I think this is deeply problematic. I live in Sweden and there, there are a few pretty disturbing examples which have uh, uh, which I've come across recently. Recently. So there is one state-owned water supplier uh, down in south of Sweden where it is now mandatory for the people to uh, exercise twice a week. And they, they, uh, they monitor the employees to make sure that they do this. And in the event of them refusing, they will have their uh, salaries frozen, they will have to sit down with the boss, and eventually they may lose, they may lose their job. If they don't, um, if they don't do what they are, are told to, and they see now exercise as part of their job. Another example is uh, a company selling um, underwear here in in Stockholm, where they have made um, exercise mandatory. And they recently did an interview with the CEO of this company, who said that he had a plan now to make uh, to try and work out the physical age of all of the people in this in this corporation which is also in my opinion uh, a breach of of integrity where suddenly because i guess the only way to find out the physical age of someone is to go through relatively thorough physical and medical examinations and he has a plan to do this uh, across the organization and he said in the interview i think it was around 50 that his goal for the next year was that his physical age would become 21. And you see this, uh, you know, the number of CEOs running marathons last year uh, doubled. And also you can see how more and more people are uh, putting things like having run a marathon or having uh, done a triathlon on their CV as if this would suggest that they are better workers or, you know, eventually basically better, better and more trustworthy people that you would want to employ. Well, okay, so we're getting a bit obsessed with uh, the physical fitness in the workplace and so on. I take your point on that. But, um, but let's go on a tangent there for a second. What about mental wellness at the workplace? What about employee assistance programs which help people uh, deal with um, what are sometimes really challenging circumstances at work that can lead to mental illness? Um, surely you're not against that. Well, surely I'm not against that. And, uh... So we have one chapter in the book where we talk about mindfulness, and we aren't sort of necessarily against mindfulness. As it happened, my co-author, you know, he, he told me by the end of uh, having finished, well, when having finished the book, that he'd been doing some mindfulness uh, uh, when feeling very stressed uh, about uh, me forcing him to, to, to write part of the book. Uh, but no, I'm not against that. I think these could be very helpful techniques. The problem is when you start thinking about meditation, when you start thinking about mindfulness and these other things as the solution to problems which may be much more uh, deeply rooted, much more systematic and much more problematic than we sometimes acknowledge. I mean, so in some corporations where, you know, you now have very sort of uh, uh, hard, uh, you know, people, people are very sort of uh, pushed very hard to work long hours and they are very stressful. And then having some kind of mindfulness techniques may help a little bit, but maybe we should also try and address the sort of deeper sort of root causes. I mean, another example of this is the, I came across this a school in California where they teach transcendental meditation, which may be great. You know, it may really help some of the students to concentrate. But the principal of this school said that transcendental meditation was a way of combating poverty, which I don't think it is. If you want to combat poverty, you have to think about it as the very deep social and political issue that it is. Yet another example is Paul Ryan, who a few years ago... Um, presented what he called an anti-poverty plan. And part of that plan was that poor people should meet a life coach, and then they would sit down together and develop an opportunity plan 
well, meeting a life coach may not be the worst thing that could happen to you, but that is not going to be the way out of poverty. And I think, again, this is, what, this is kind of what positive thinking is doing. This is what the wellness ideology is doing, is that you think that some of you, there's a very strong belief in these techniques that they could, if you just teach them to individuals, then they will self-help them out of the situation they are. But these situations are much more uh, uh, problematic and much more sort of deep-seated uh, than we sometimes want to acknowledge. Well, Carl, it worked for Paul Ryan. He's now the Speaker of the Congress in the United States, right? Well, it worked for him, but I'm not sure it worked that well for all of the poor people he was uh, ostensibly um, going to help. Understood. Let's, uh, okay, so you, you have identified this wellness syndrome and therefore, uh, having identified it, we need to come to you to find out what the cure is for this syndrome. Uh, what would you suggest? Well, I guess there are a few different things. One thing is just to disconnect morality from health and understanding that just because you're an unhealthy person doesn't mean necessarily that you are a bad person. So that would be one, one, one start. The other thing is to go from uh, this kind of moralism that we have now and a sense of always trying to feel that we are the moral, nice uh, a person. And instead try to think about ethics, which always involve other people, and trying to take some of the concentration, some of the attention that we now put on ourselves and our own body, and instead direct that towards the world. And I guess finally, a lot of this sort of wellness, self-help uh, sort of world is really defined by, uh, a, I think, a very bad or, or non-existent non sense of humor. So I think comedy and humor could go some way in understanding that being a human being isn't always something that is, is so easy. It doesn't always add up. And, you know, uh, trying to reach that sense of absolute perfection may be a pretty bad idea. Instead, you may be better off accepting some of the limitation mm -hmm that is involved in being human and instead doing a little bit more to try and solve problems in the world, which may actually be much easier to address than address those, if you like, almost inner splits that it means to be a human being. Let me just pick up on the first thing you said there, that unhealthy doesn't equal bad. Okay, mm. I take your point, but for those who look at smokers or those who look at people who are morbidly obese and say, you are going to raise my taxes because treating you in hospitals is going to cost so much more than it will cost a healthy person or somebody who doesn't, uh, you know, uh, abuse food or abuse alcohol or abuse cigarettes. Why is that not a reasonable conclusion to come to? Well, that's, it's, it's, it's very funny you would say that because uh, there was a Dutch study um, a few years ago who suggested that the people who are really costing society most are people like, I suppose, yourself. You look like a very healthy uh, man and uh, and myself, you know, I'm 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 a very I'm you know I'm a reasonably uh, healthy person. We are the people who cost society most because when we retire, we just keep on living forever and ever. <laughs> you know, a smoker, obese people tend to work and then they die. You know, from a strictly, uh, if you you know, from a strictly economical point of view, they cost society much less because they're not going to collect their like pensions, ourselves. right? Sorry? They're not going to collect their pensions and therefore they'll cost us less in the end. Is that the idea? That's right. That's right. Well, hmm. people like the two of us, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, well, at least I hope we will be a big burden to society and, and the welfare society as we go in, in and out of hospital until we are very, very old. Uh, amen to that. Okay. Carl, it's good having you on the program tonight. Carl Cedarstrom from the Stockholm Business School at Stockholm University. He's the co-author of The Wellness Syndrome. It's good to meet you, and thanks for being on TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.